Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Mike, this is my whiteboard, and if you're brand new to this show, this is a show where we break down concepts, we talk about strategies, we talk about different adjustments for trades, and we try and provide them in a visual format for you to help learn and facilitate those of you that are visual learners. So today we're going to talk about debit spread adjustments, and for me, there's really only one adjustment that I would consider making if a debit spread did go against me. Now tomorrow we're going to be talking about some adjustments for inversions and three things to be considerate of when we're going inverted. So that will be an awesome segment as well, but we've gotten a lot of great feedback on the adjustment series, so we're gonna continue on with that. So when we're looking at debit spreads in particular, there are a few adjustments that can be made, but it's very different than a credit spread where we're looking to roll for a credit. It's virtually impossible to roll the entire spread on a debit spread for a credit, so we usually stray away from that, and that's why you don't really see that activity on maybe the Doe follow page if you follow some of the traders there. But there is one thing that I might make an adjustment for when we're looking at a debit spread going against us, and it took me a while to come to this conclusion, but I think I think it's a viable strategy in the long run if we're willing to give up some max profit to just reduce our overall max loss and possibly give us a better chance of being successful at the end of the debit spread trade. So let's go on to the next slide here and we'll look at three keys for the debit spreads in general. The very first one is that we usually look at debit spreads when we're in a low volatility environment. This isn't to say that debit spreads will be beneficial in a low volatility environment or that it might not hurt us in a low volatility environment, but really when we're looking at low volatility environments, this is when we normally open up our array of strategies to debit spreads because of the fact that when we're in a high volatility environment, we don't really focus on debit spreads because of all the research we've shown of credit spreads and selling premium being much more beneficial than the debit spread. But when we're in a low volatility environment, sometimes those opportunities are not there, so that's when we might look at maybe looking into a debit spread to just keep engaged and get some of the long Vegas that we would be looking for to balance our portfolio. The second key here is to straddle the stock price. So if you missed our, our previous segment on creating a debit spread and how to set it up, we normally will buy an in the money option and sell an equidistant or maybe a little bit closer than equidistant option out of the money to give ourselves a break, a break even that is right around that stock price or maybe just a little bit better, which is our best case scenario. And that's the scenario we're going to use in this particular segment today. And last but not least, the biggest key with debit spreads is to understand what we're doing with the debit spread. Instead of just buying a naked option and giving us that infinite upside, really what we're doing and what we're focusing on is reducing the cost basis of our long option. That's what gives us the highest probability of success. That's what does cap our upside, but we're all about the high probability of success and reducing our max loss on the trade, which is exactly what spreading off a long option will do. So let's go on to the next slide and we'll talk about a very first situation here when the stock goes down. And really this is the only consideration that I would maybe make when I'm looking at adjusting one of the legs or maybe both of the legs on a debit spread. In this particular example, we're going to look at just adjusting the short option on the debit spread. So we've got a 95105 call spread here, a long call spread. So we know that since we're long this call spread, the stock price is at 100, and we were able to pretty much balance it equally. So we've got the long call in the money. Again, a call option is the right to buy 100 shares of stock. So I know that it's going to be in the money if the stock price is above my call strike, or if my call strike is below that stock price, because of the fact that at expiration, it's going to have intrinsic value. At expiration, my 95 call allows me to buy shares at 95, and if the stock price is trading at 100, which is norm where the market is trading right now, no one can really buy the, the stock at 95 unless you own the call at 95. So it's going to have intrinsic value. Otherwise, you'd have to go into the market and buy the stock at 100. We're also selling a call against this long call at 105. So we have a completely equidistant option spread here. And 
for whatever reason, we were able to get a debit that was a little bit better and put our break even a little bit better than where the stock price is trading. In some situations, you might see this trading for exactly $5, which would put your break even right at where the stock price is trading. If I'm paying $5 for this, and I know that my long call is in the money by five points, and I know that because I'm just taking the stock price and subtracting my call strike from that, which gives me a difference of five points. And if I'm able to buy this spread for five points, that means that if the stock price does not move at all, my short call is of course going to expire worthless. So it would have done the effective thing that it's doing in this spread in essentially reducing the cost basis of my long option because of the fact that I know that my long call isn't going to be trading for less than $5. Because it has all this time value, let's say that this is a 45 days till expiration trade, it's going to be trading for at least $5, just this naked call. Maybe it would be trading for something like 750, where it has $2.50 of extrinsic value, or time and volatility value. And we're hedging that cost with the sale of the short call. So I know that, Right here, if I'm able to buy this spread for $4.90 and the stock price is at 100, if the stock price does not move at all, if it doesn't move one penny and it stays at 100.00, my short call would expire worthless and my long call, I would be able to sell out of that and sell that back to the market to close the position for $5. So I know that if the stock price doesn't move, then I bought this spread for $4.90. If I'm able to sell it to the market for $5, that means that I would profit to the tune of 10 cents. And because of that, I know that my break even is just a little bit better. It would be just a little bit to the left as opposed to just buying the stock outright. And I'm going to be using much less capital for this trade instead of just buying the, stock, the shares outright where I would be spending $10,000 for buying 100 shares of this $100 value stock and instead I'm spending $4.90 or $490 to get that same upside move of five points that I'm looking for. So the important thing to consider when we're looking at adjusting this particular spread is understanding that I have a 10 point wide spread here. So what is one thing that I might consider if the spread goes against me or if the stock price goes against me? If I'm long a call spread, first of all, I know that I'm bullish. The best case scenario is that the stock price goes above the short call, which would leave me with a max profit of $5.10 at expiration. And all, I know, all I'm doing to calculate that is understanding that since this is 10 points wide, if the stock price goes up here, then I'm going to be able to sell this spread for about $10. And since I bought it for $4.90, I take the difference of that, and that gives me that $5.10 value of max profit. So what would happen if the stock price went down? Well, there would be one thing that I could do if the stock price went down. And if I'm willing to give up my max profit potential, and my main concern is just reducing my max loss and possibly giving myself a little bit better of a profit than that 10 cent profit we were talking about, would be to move my short call down to where somewhere around this, where the stock price was trading when I originally entered the trade. So let's consider this for a second. So I've got my short strike at 105. Let's say that the stock price went down below 95 and I was able to roll down my short call in the same exact expiration cycle to the 100 strike, which would leave me with a five point wide call spread. And let's say I was able to roll that short call down for 30 cents. So what would I have effectively done if I had done this particular adjustment? Well, I would have reduced my net position debit by 30 cents, which would leave me with a net position debit of $4.60. So what does this mean? At the end of the day, this means that if the stock price stays below there and my, sh my calls expire out of the money, I would basically only be losing $4.60 or $460 as opposed to $490. So that's obviously a benefit, but there is one other benefit that's always interesting to consider. So let's say the stock price actually does come back up. So let's say the stock price comes up to 105 at expiration. 
Now, of course, I'm not going to be able to get that max profit that I was able to obtain before, but since I reduced my net position debit to 460, and I moved my short call down to this 100 strike here, if the stock price was anywhere above the 100 strike, I would be able to close out of this spread for about $5 because I have that 95 strike that's in the money. My short call would be moved to the 100 strike. And if I'm able to close out my spread for $5 and I know that my net position debit is $4.60, that would result in a profit of 40 cents. So yes, at the end of the day, I wouldn't be able to reap the benefits of the max profit in my original position. However, if I'm able to adjust my strike down to an acceptable level, reduce my max loss if the spread expires out of the money and totally worthless, and at the same time, give myself the ability to make 40 cents on this trade, maybe it's an adjustment that I would consider. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about another reason why we don't really adjust it in any other scenario. So again, let's say the stock goes up. So we've got a 10 point wide spread here. Everything is the same. We bought it for $4.90. If the stock price goes up, I'm not going to make any adjustments because just like in a situation where we have a covered call, where a lot of people will say, well, now the call strike is completely breached and I don't know what to do. Should I adjust this position? Well, we wouldn't really adjust this position because this is exactly what we wanted to happen. When we entered the trade, we knew that we're capping our max profit because we're reducing the cost basis of our long call and we're eliminating that unlimited upside profit potential. I know that if the stock price is anywhere above this short call here, I'm going to be at max profit. And that max profit in this scenario is $5.10. So if the stock price does end up going up, at expiration, if my spread is entirely in the money, I know that I'm going to profit about $5.10. Now one interesting thing to point out is that if the stock price shoots up a couple days after you put on the trade, you're not going to be at max profit right away. We still need that extrinsic value to come out of those options. And that's because of the fact that, yes, although the 95 long call will show a nice profit if the stock goes up, you are going to see a loss on this short call because of the fact that the call strike has been breached by the stock price. At expiration, even though you might not see max profit right away, you will see max profit at expiration because these options are going to be trading for close to intrinsic value. So this short call is going to be at a loss of the intrinsic value, but it's going to be completely offset by the gains on this long call here. So I know that if I've got a 10 point wide spread here, that at expiration, I'm going to be able to close that spread for around 10 cents, or $10 I should say. So if I know that I purchased this for $4.90, which is a perfect scenario in terms of where my break even is and my probability of success, and I know that I'm able to close this out for $10, I'm going to reap the benefits of that max profit at expiration. So for that reason, we wouldn't make an adjustment on this particular example. But let's go on to the next slide and we'll look at what happens when the stock price does not change at all. So again, if the stock does not change at all, and I know that I've got myself in a good position in terms of break even, and in the essence that I'm not going to really lose money if the stock price doesn't change, we're really not going to make an adjustment here either. Because if the stock price is unchanged, and I know that I purchased this spread for $4.90, if the stock price is right at 100, my short call is going to expire worthless. My long call, I'm going to be able to close out for about $5, which would leave me with a profit of 10 cents. Now, there is one thing that we could do if we really wanted to near expiration, and if we're not really sure where the stock price is going to go, or if we're comfortable with collecting a little bit of extra premium and not really hindering our loss at all, what we might do is potentially roll this call down closer to the stock price. I can probably collect a small credit. Of course, I'm not gonna do this for a credit of five cents or anything like that because of the fact that there are commissions in this trade. So if I roll this short call down to maybe the 102 or the 101, if I'm not collecting maybe 20 or 30 cents, 
then I'm probably not going to consider doing that because I know I'm going to be closing this out with the dough commission structure. It's going to be $1.50 and I'm going to be opening a new trade for another $1.50. So I need to make sure that I'm considering commissions in terms of whatever credit I'm actually receiving. And at the end of the day, if I'm not able to reduce my max loss on the trade like we saw in the first example where we were, we were able to reduce our max loss by 30 cents and we basically moved the stock price or the, the strike price down to where the stock price was originally trading. If I'm not going to be able to reduce it by that much, it's probably not worth it for me to make any sort of adjustment on this particular strategy here. So if the stock is unchanged, we're probably not going to make an adjustment. If the premium is there, and let's say the premium is really juiced up and I'm able to move this strike down for a decent sized credit, including commissions, then maybe I'll move it down just to get, collect a little bit more premium if I don't think the stock price is going to go up above 105. So let's wrap all these things together with some takeaways for you. The very first takeaway is that in my eyes, there's really only one viable adjustment for debit spreads, particularly the standard debit spread where we're looking at debit vertical spreads. And that is where if the stock price goes against us and it leaves us with two out of the money options, maybe we would consider rolling the strike, the short strike down to where the stock price was originally trading if we can collect a decent sized credit while doing that. As you saw, it does reduce the max profit on the trade, but if the stock price does return to where it was, it's going to give us a better profit than if we had made no adjustment at all. And if the stock price completely goes against us, we're reducing our max loss by doing that. So it's all about remembering that the key of debit spreads is understanding that really all we're doing is we're taking that long option and we're reducing the cost basis of that long option by selling another option against it. So the more we can reduce our cost basis and lower our max losses at any point is going to be beneficial in the end and help us with those losing trades. Secondly, just like I said, the key is cost basis reduction of the long option. I think it's something that's overlooked a lot when we're looking at debit spreads and vertical spreads in particular. Really what we're doing is we're reducing our max loss. So if we look at that particular example where we had that 10 point wide spread, let's say my 95 call was trading for $7.50 and I was able to sell that short call for $2.60. That would give me that net debit of $4.90. Now, if I had not done that altogether and I just bought that long call that was in the money, I could have lost $7.50 or $750, which is almost double the price of what I was going to lose if I made those adjustments and got my net debit down to $4.60. So it's really important to understand that when we're looking at vertical debit spreads, we're really just reducing the cost basis of that long option that's going to be giving us profit in the end. And lastly, if we roll for a debit consistently, we can lock, our, lock ourselves into a loss. So this is a great question that we get all the time on the support channels, and that's what should I do with the debit spread? Should I roll it for a debit? And if we do that continually, we can actually lock ourselves into a loss. If we look at that previous example where I've got a 10 point wide spread and I originally bought it for $4.90, if I keep rolling it, let's say I roll it for 50 cents, and then I roll it again for 50 cents, and roll it again. Eventually, if my cost basis on that trade is $10 and I've got a 10 point wide spread, I can't possibly make any money on that trade. So it's really important to understand that when we roll, we really like to roll for credits and that's why you'll see us rolling with credit spreads and naked options as opposed to long debit spreads. So hopefully this was helpful. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Mike. If you've got any questions or feedback at all, shoot me an email at support at dough.com or support at or you can tweet me at DoeTraderMike. But we've got Jim Schultz coming up next, so stay tuned. Hey everyone, thanks for watching our video. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up or share it with a friend. Click below to watch more videos, subscribe to our channel, or go to our website.